Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Butcher, the Director of Outreach for Wildlands Network. I am grateful that you're going to spend some time with us today, and we're very excited to tell you about this brand new initiative. Over my 13 years with Wildlands Network, I have come to know many of you who are joining us today, so I am really pleased to see your names. I'd like to introduce Greg Costello. He is our executive director, and Greg has provided the strategic direction for Wildlands Network's programs and management. He also leads his, lends his expertise to our Connectivity Policy Coalition, which was initiated by Wildlands Network in 2008. Greg grew up exploring the woods of Pennsylvania. He studied biology at the University of Virginia, where he was first introduced to the biogeographical concepts that form the bedrock of Wildlands Network's scientific approach. After college, he headed west to attend law school at the University of Colorado. And after graduating, Greg pursued a 16-year career in environmental law before beginning his decade-long stint as executive director for the Western Environmental Law Center in Eugene, Oregon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Greg lives in Seattle with his wife, Cindy, his son, Ian, and his two energetic English Springer Spaniels, Jack and Penelope. And when he's not corralling an international and virtual organization, you can find him cycling, scuba diving, sea kayaking, and partaking in the region's culinary delights. I checked in with Greg this morning to make sure that um, I was right when I said he has been with Wildlands Network for five years, and he said to me, and one month. So um, he's counting the days, and we are very lucky to have him. Next, I'd like to introduce Jessica Schaefer. She is our coordinator for the Wildlands Network's Law and Policy Program's growing efforts in the Pacific Northwest. She's also the director of our nascent Pacific Wildlife Program, what we're going to talk to you about today. Jessica was born and raised in Southern California, and she earned her BS degree in wildlife, fish, and conservation biology from the University of California, Davis. She then pursued a degree in environmental law and graduated from Lewis and Clark Law School in 2007. She began working with, the, and I hope I say this properly, the Gifford Pinchot Task Force. Task Force? Um, which is now Cascade Forest Conservancy, and I beg your apologies for all of you in the Pacific Northwest. Over the next six years, Jessica managed projects focusing on private lands, ESA listings, timber sales, gra grazing rights, mining, and off-highway vehicle use on public lands. She's also served as legal counsel on administrative appeals, litigation, and settlements. Jessica currently lives in Redmond, Washington, with her husband, two small children, and dog, Leo. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Rebecca Hunter to you. She's the newest member of the Wildlands Network family, and she leads public engagement for the Pacific Wildway Project. Rebecca is engaging supporters and community members and developing connectivity education and promoting wildlife advocacy in the Pacific Project area. She's also promoting our brand new blog, Trusting Wildness. Rebecca graduated from Colorado College in 2016, where she studied ecology and English. She worked as a research assistant on a demography study of flammulated owls and went on to conduct independent research on the climatic and environmental factors that influenced their brood dynamics. After college, she taught sixth grade science at a public charter school in San Jose, California, where she emphasized the value of excellent science writing and took an interdisciplinary approach to STEM education. Rebecca moved to Seattle and joined our team in the fall of 2017. Off the clock, Rebecca likes to hike, climb, snowshoe, kayak, birdwatch, camp, and stargaze in the Pacific Northwest backcountry. She enjoys reading, rowing, and is on a Seattle crew team, actually, and loves listening to music. So without any further ado, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited, and we really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day to join us. And I am going to hand over to Greg Costello, our executive director. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, um, as the case may be. 
Um, we're very happy that you were able to join us this morning. I'm going to give just a brief overview of uh, what we're up to and our hopes in the Pacific Northwest, but most of the time this morning uh, will be uh, given to Jessica and Rebecca as they're leading our efforts here in the Northwest. So um, let's get this show started. As you can see, you know, the Cascadia region has long thought of itself as uh, a whole ecosystem. And many of us up in the Northwest have pined for uh, the Cascadia, greater Cascadia to actually succeed from the rest of the United States at times. That was a strong prevailing uh, feeling during the last election, but we're still here. Uh, it is a unique place, uh, one of the most intact ecosystems in North America. Uh, we have a relatively progressive uh, social and political climate. And when you look at climate change adaptation models, uh, Cascadia region tends to fare better than, than many, with many uh, projecting it to be a, a refugia for climate change. So just to recap, our mission to reconnect, restore, and rewild North America so that life in all of its diversity can thrive. When I came on board five years ago, we were focused on our work in the Rocky Mountains in the Southwest and on the Eastern um, Wildway in North America. And one of, the, one of the discussions five years ago was, um, this is great, we're doing great work, but really, we need to get a presence on the Pacific Coast, particularly if our headquarters is going to be here in Seattle. So as you know, uh, you've probably all seen this map in various iterations. It's old. Uh, it goes almost back to our founding days in the early 1990s, and it shows our vision of these large connected uh, swaths of land that we called wildways. And in the early 90s, when Michael Soleil and Dave Foreman and our David Johns and our other founders um, were talking about this, um, it was discounted as pretty much a pie in the sky idea that you could actually protect such large swaths of land, that connectivity of habitat was really important, that the presence of carnivores was necessary. All of these theories were being pushed by Wildlands Network uh, pretty much in a, in a vacuum. If we fast forward to today, wildlife corridors and the, that concept has become fairly ubiquitous. It was adopted in 2008 by Governor Friedenthal and the Western Governors Association as an initiative which um, promoted each state in the Western Governors region to look at wildlife corridors and connectivity and its progressed faster in some states than others. Washington State did a pretty good job until they ran out of money about six or seven years ago. Uh, but this idea has been picked up. It's been picked up by organizations as large as the Nature Conservancy. And now even um, our Secretary of Interior, Zinke, is talking about wildlife migration and wildlife corridors. He just appointed a new czar for um, animal migration a week ago Friday. So even in this administration, there is some support for these concepts. But our work as it's progressed in the Southwest and in the East, we've learned a lot. We've combined science and we've combined collaborative conservation. And now we're ready to take those lessons learned and, and bring them here to the Pacific region. And so this is where we live and work. Um, you know, our office is pretty much in the, the uh, upper left quadrant of, of this picture downtown. But, you know, as our bios describe, where we really prefer to be, although I would say that none of us spend as much time out down around Mount Rainier or in the woods as our bios might make you think, um, but really it's in, in the outdoors that we like to uh, spend our time and, and effort and I'm really happy that this year, finally after five years, we feel like we're at a point to begin the building of the Pacific Wildway. And to do that, 
uh, I feel very fortunate in being able to uh, hire both Jessica and Rebecca as Jessica's resume um, indicates. She has extensive experience both in law and in wildlife biology and in working with the other conservation groups in this region who will be critical to our success. So I will uh, be happy to chime in more when we get to the question and answer section, but I'm gonna turn you now to uh, Jessica and give her the reins and let her tell you about our plans uh, here in the Pacific Wildway. Hi, um, my name is Jessica Schaefer, like Greg pointed out earlier. And as uh, Tracy mentioned, I do have experience actually all along our Pacific region. Uh, I was born in California and raised there until I was 20, oh my gosh, 24 or something like that, when I moved um, to Oregon to pursue a degree in law. And then I lived in Oregon for 10 years and built a career there. And um, when my husband moved up to Seattle for his career, I um, was fortunate enough to have met Greg and started working here at Wildlands Network last year. So um, I have experience both in all three states in our Pacific and I really enjoy working here. Um, I am going to talk more about our Pacific Wildway and the projects that we're building here in the Pacific. Um, as you can see from our, our first uh, point here, that one of the main building blocks of our Pacific Wildway is creating a science blueprint that's going to highlight and prioritize projects that we're going to be pursuing on the ground to create our linkages from BC to Baja. The other uh, uh, work that we're going to be um, doing here in the Pacific is creating laws and policies and regulations that really re reflect where we're going in the 21st century towards wildlife protection, connectivity, and how we address climate change now that that's become a uh, big factor here. Um, and how we're going to do that is by creating a collaborative conservation approach using our partner organizations and individuals who are interested in um, pursuing our work on the ground. And I'll be talking about what uh, ideas we have for that work as we move forward here. The other thing that I know Greg and Rebecca are going to be talking about, as will I, is how we are going to nurture um, a, a fundamental change in how we view our relationship with other species and our relationship with um, the ecosystem that surrounds us. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on. So we have two main goals in our Pacific Wildway program. And the first one is to advance adaptation and connectivity for vulnerable species in key regions in this area. Um, but really we are trying to build connectivity all the way from the border of British Columbia down to Baja, California, and hopefully into Mexico. And we'll, we'll show you some mapping as we move forward. The other big goal of our Pacific Wildway program is to educate and build a network of um, political force and local conservation agencies, individuals who can really do the work on the ground that's necessary to create this connectivity as we move forward. And Rebecca will talk more about that as we move forward. Again, this slide's just reiterating those um, points that I had talked about earlier, so I'm gonna move forward here. So our first point is science. Uh, our our uh, first real main uh, objective of our project, and one that we're actually working on this year, is to create the science-based pl blueprint for connectivity in the Pacific. So. We are fortunate, uh, fortunate enough here um, in Washington and in Seattle to work with some really great scientists out of the University of Washington who've been doing mapping work like this uh, for, oh my gosh, um, a while now. So we're actually working with Josh Lawler um, and his uh, creative conservation lab out of the University of Washington to um, look at uh, several points. So one that we're looking at is key species and habitat needs. Um, those key species we're identifying, and some of them you'll recognize, are obviously wolves, wolverine, grizzly bear, but some others that we uh, don't normally look at, like pika, marmot. Um, and we're going to be mapping their habitat needs as we move into uh, the 21st, uh, or in the 21st century, but <laughs> as we move forward, but ha addressing their needs um, in the face of climate change. The other thing we're looking at is critical habitat areas. So critical habitat areas um, doesn't necessarily 
reflect endangered species or rare species, but areas that we need to be focused on for species as we move from north to south or south to north, depending on what our species needs. The other piece that we're looking at is current ongoing habitat projects. And what I mean by that is partnering with organizations, other NGOs, other federal agencies, state agencies, and individual project private forest lands who are working on habitat projects on the ground. That could be overpasses, underpasses, that could be wilderness designations, it could be um, FSC certifications on private forest land. And next, we'll be looking at connectivity gaps. So gaps in where that work is being done on the ground, gaps in where we're not covering critical habitat needs. And we're putting that on a large scale map. The map you see on the right hand side is actually the map that Wildlands Network is producing um, on the east. And I don't know, Greg, if you want to chime in a little bit about that. Sure. So in uh, Durham, our office in Durham, North Carolina, um, Dr. Ronald Sutherland is a PhD uh, scientist who studied under one of our founders, John Turborg, at Duke University. Uh, and he has worked in a collaborative fashion with uh, the Nature Conservancy and their resilient habitats analysis and with a number of government efforts and other um, organizations like Wild, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society to take all of the available mapping and, and data that they could find for the East and put it into a composite map uh, showing the areas of uh, existing or potential core habitat, that's the, uh, the, the green, and then modeling where and how you would connect these areas. The connective corridors are the yellow. And this is based on uh, existing forest cover. It's not, it's, this map is ambitious, but it's not pie in the sky. It's based on existing conditions and it excludes all of the uh, heavily impacted uh, human habitation areas. Interestingly, and without uh, intent, when you count the number of uh, hectares shown in this map as core and connective corridors, and you look at the larger uh, region that it's uh, taken out of uh, in North America, it comes up to 51% of the uh, surface and water area for that region, uh, which of course is consistent with uh, the position that we've held uh, for many, many years that biodiversity needs 40 to 60 percent of the Earth's surface uh, to persist in a healthy way. And uh, consistent, of course, uh, Dr. E.O. Wilson has uh, picked up that drumbeat with his half Earth. Um, organization and campaign to try to build support for that. For those of you who are in Seattle and are music fans, apparently Paul uh, Simon uh, is donating all of his proceeds from his current tour to the E.O. Wilson Foundation to pursue this goal. Uh, he, he had a concert here in Seattle last weekend. It was very well received. So what we're going to... Oh, can we go back? It's okay. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out is you might be asking why more mapping here in the Pacific? Because as you know, there's a lot of um, organizations and federal agencies that have done mapping here in the Pacific that looks both at climate change and at connectivity. Um, but one of the things that we noticed in, in talking with our, our uh, other NGO and, and federal agencies that, is that no one has actually connected those maps from BC to Baja to look at both international crossing and state, uh, state crossings. So there's a lot of work that's been done in Washington um, in 2007. Washington Habitat Connectivity Analysis um, had started and, and was completed in 2010. And one of the big projects, and I'll talk about this later, was the I-90 uh, bridge overpasses that were being built um, now. And um, But one of the things, one of the issues that we saw was that um, no one is actually talking about how to bring animals all the way from BC down into California. And in animals like wolves, animals like wolverine, who need these large landscapes and, and need the opportunity to migrate um, down between states. The other um, reason I put these two maps on here is to show you that here in the Pacific, all of our federal uh, lands are, are actually well connected. But I don't put this on to say that 
we are lucky because we have a lot of federal land, we still need to protect those areas and to build on those and use those as our building blocks. Um, there's a lot of issues currently going on with the Northwest Forest Plan revision process and how do we get wildlife connectivity language into that. I'll address that later as well. But um, so not only do we need to focus efforts on continuing to protect our federal lands as building blocks for this wildlife connectivity from BC to Baja, but also to build on them. Um, as you know, um, and I, what I'll point out here, and you'll see this as we move forward, these little three little red um, spots you see on this map. These are private conservation easements. One of the toughest challenges we face here in the Pacific is working with private forest landowners. Those private forest landowners have large, large um, landscapes that they operate and manage. So that um, is something that we uh, have as a challenge out here in the Pacific is how to engage those private forest landowners. How do we bring them into a collaborative and have a productive conversation to talk about connectivity on the ground. So uh, Wildlands Network has, has had success in working with private landowners in the West, and we hope to continue that success out here in the Pacific. And we're already starting conversations with private landowners as we move forward. So what we're doing on the ground or how we plan to implement on the ground. So um, here we're creating conservation, uh, collaborative conservation partners, and that is um, partners like other NGOs, Cascade Forest Conservancy, uh, Hills Canyon Preservation Council, ONDAS, uh, organizations like that. But federal agencies, state agencies, Department of Transportation, um, LLCs, those uh, folks we're also engaging with and utilizing some of their mapping to show us where we need to be focused on our uh, work on the ground. So um, as you can see, this uh, picture right here is actually a rendition of the I-90 overpass that is currently um, underway to be finished, actually, by the end of 2018. So these are the types of projects that we're talking about identifying. Um, this wilderness expansion, um, FSC certification on private forest lands, those are the types of methods we are seeking to create wildlife connectivity all the way into California from up here in Seattle. So one of the biggest challenges we face, though, is funding these opportunities. Um, I, I'm not sure how familiar all of our um, folks on this call are with the I-90 project, but there, there was uh, $551 million that were received from the 2005 gas tax to fund the widening of I-90 and to build this overpass. So you might not think, oh, $551 million, but that was just in phase one. So there's quite a bit more funding needed to continue the project. There's another, there's uh, two other underpasses and another overpass that are slated for I-90 as we move forward. I-90 in Washington is considered to be one of, one of the greatest impediments to the um, east-west corridor coming down in, in Washington and bringing wolves over into the South Cascades. So this is a, an incredible opportunity and it was highlighted by the Washington Habitat Connectivity Work. Um, the issue with this is how do we continue this momentum and bring it into southern Washington and into Oregon and California, where they, all, they are also doing projects like this. But we need to find the funding and the opportunities to do that. So working with these agencies together, we hope that we can move forward with that. So one of the um, next slides here, where I just wanted to highlight for you are what are some of the species we're talking about that will benefit from the Pacific Wildway? So wolves are one of them, elk, spotted owl, wolverine, orca whales, which we haven't really talked on, but because of, talked about, but the Pacific also has that marine component that is going to be incredibly important as we move forward. And most of all, humans, um, which was supposed to show up there, but didn't, so we apologize for that. <laughs> Um, the next piece that I wanted to touch on um, is our policy. What are some of the opportunities we have here to affect change on policy? So we have quite a bit um, here in the Pacific, uh, large opportunities to work on legislation. But this piece here is actually our national legislation um, that we're hoping to work on. So in, it, it was introduced in 2016 by Congressman Don Beyer the National Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act. So what that act um, is hoping to do is to establish a national wildlife corridor system 
that provides protection and restoration of native fish, wildlife, and plant species. What, it, what it's intended to do is to require the Department of Interior to develop strategies for corridor systems throughout the country. It's intended to promote public safety and mitigate species damage where there's corridors that cross roadways. It establishes a wildlife corridor stewardship and protection fund to support the management and protection of corridors and other lands and waters important connectivity. And it provides authority to acquire land and interest in inland from using funds from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, Corridor Stewardship and Protection Fund, and private donations. What, the reason why I wanted to talk about that was identifying this opportunity um, to move that sort of big level concept of national wildlife corridor system more to a local and state level opportunity. So working here in the Pacific, um, where we have progressive um, politics and pr progressive environmental regulations that we can hopefully move more towards identifying opportunities in local governments as well as state governments to create wildlife corridor legislation here in these specific states. Um, hopefully what we can plan to do then is to work with our partners to create that legislation and conduct grassroots organizing um, around that type of work. So I wanted to bring this up. Um, here are some examples of state corridor legislation that one that passed in New Hampshire in May of 2016. And this was just a study bill to identify um, opportunities for wildlife corridors and wildlife cro um, crossings in highways in that state. The other I wanted to mention was California. And this is State Assembly Bill 498. And it was made for that state, it was a, a policy that created an opportunity for local governments and the state government to identify wildlife corridors in the state of California and to ensure that there was continued functioning of that corridor. But the reason I put this one up here is that um, just to talk about ways that we can improve on those um, state legislative opportunities, because currently in California there are lawsuits over whether or not wildlife corridors are being considered when building new housing developments, for example. So in Temecula, there's a case going on right now um, that involves a housing development that would disrupt cougar, um, cougar uh, corridor functions. And so we'll see how that plays out. But an opportunity here is to how do we strengthen these legislations to create more opportunity for wildlife corridors on the ground to be protected and move forward in a more um, effective manner. The next um, idea that I wanted to talk about is restructuring our state agencies and federal agencies to meet um, opportunities, right? So how do we safeguard biodiversity rather than just talking about game species like elk or other um, elk and deer? Let's talk about how we can safeguard biodiversity by talking about the needs of wolves, grizzly bears, wolverine, and include those species in the overall direction of state agencies like the Department of Fish and Wildlife, public lands, um, and move them more towards a biodiversity directive. The other couple points I wanted to talk about is preserving the public trust doctrine here in these states. So how do we foster the idea that public lands are necessary to ensure the continuance of biodiversity as well as um, ensuring public lands for future generations. So one of those things is by making sure that we have an agencies or agencies, so Fish and Wildlife, um, State Department of Public Land, State Department of Transportation that are both trusted and honest in their communications to the public about preserving the um, these wildlife corridors or also wildlife that states um, know to enjoy. For example, there's over a 70% um, approval rating for wolves in the state of Washington. So how do we build that trust in the agencies and um, make sure that we are meeting the needs of what the state public wants to see on the ground? Um, the other necessary piece to restructuring our agencies is ensuring that state agencies work together to implement conservation priorities. For example, here in Washington, how do we make sure that our Department of Public Lands is working with our Department of Fish and Wildlife to ensure that climate change opportunities are, um, are considered? So the other one I put here, seamless co cooperation with partners. So who are those partners? NGOs, uh, LLCs, federal LLCs, uh, tribal partners, and individuals who are really interested in implementing this sort of biodiversity directive on the ground. Um, 
So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier as I was talking about ways that we can implement on the ground conservation. And some of those are advocating for wildlife connectivity language in forest plan revisions. So for example, currently in um, Washington and Oregon, it's the Northwest forest plan revision process as we're moving forward or through that. One of my jobs here is to advocate for wildlife connectivity language to be inserted into the Northwest forest plan and to provide opportunity for that Northwest Forest Plan to ensure that wildlife connectivity flows down through other, other forest plan that are managed under that language. So um, these are other ideas that we're thinking about here and we need to pursue or at least research a little bit further, but administrative withdrawals in areas where there is wildlife connectivity or corridors that have been identified either through our mapping or through mapping that's been done by the Forest Service or by other state agencies. So, um, for example, if there is a uh, forest timber project that's being done, say, in the Gifford Pinchot in southern in the Southern Cascade region here in Washington, if there's a wildlife corridor that's been identified in there, is there a way that in that forest, uh, that decision, we can administratively withdraw those areas from timber production when there is a valuable wildlife corridor? Um, in that area or that's identified in that area. So these are opportunities that we are currently looking at to work with other agencies, both federal and state, on how, how do we implement this on the ground. So hopefully uh, the outcome of this project area would be that important gap areas or those areas that we identified in our map um, are protected on the ground. So I'm gonna pass over the presentation now to Rebecca Hunter, who's going to be leading our engagement education project. Great. Hi, all. Um, so in addition to the science and policy directions, uh, we believe that education out outreach are essential to creating the momentum behind reconnecting the region. Uh, so we have an education and outreach plan whose purpose is to educate viewers on the unique wildlife needs that we're addressing with our Pacific Wildway. Um, additionally, to build engagement and support behind our Pacific Wildway in its early stages uh, to empower local citizens to um, accomplish our mission through environmental advocacy and to cultivate partnerships in the region and to fundraise. So for 2018, our education and outreach plan primarily focuses on the Seattle area uh, and that will serve as a foundation to build upon for 2019. Uh, so we've identified three major projects that we'd like to accomplish this year. Uh, the first of which is a media project. Uh, so we are in development of a Pacific Wildway documentary film, which we will produce, promote, and distribute. Uh, this film will educate viewers on the biodiversity crisis in the region. It will showcase the species and the environments that will benefit from connectivity, and it will introduce viewers to Wildlands Network and our efforts in the Pacific. Additionally, uh, we are planning two large events in the Seattle area uh, whose purpose is to um, encourage local activism and an active local following with our project, uh, as well as instigate donations and on-the-ground support for our work out here. Uh, we're planning a launch event where we will unveil our map that's planned for the fall, uh, as well as a um, end of year fundraising event. Our third major project this year is an education project. Uh, so our plan is to develop formal connectivity curriculum uh, collab in collaboration with administrators and educators in the Seattle King County area. Um, to ultimately present in two science classrooms during the 2018 and 2019 school year. In addition to these major projects, we have several minor projects, which include building our social media presence, uh, consistent blog posts, smaller local outreach events, and coordinating more on the ground with other organizations and business partners in the area. Uh, so our progress thus far, uh, we have established a film team for our Pacific Wildway documentary. We've set up an advi advisory council of key colleagues in environmental media um, and have conducted introductory interviews with 
the interviewees we are going to feature in our film. Um, we have applied for several grants for funding, uh, and our goal is to have funding to start production in fall 2018. Uh, our progress with events, uh, we have planned an event at the Patagonia store in downtown Seattle for late June. Uh, we've tabled downtown for Endangered Species Day on May 18th. Uh, and we're currently contacting business sponsors to support our launch event in September. Um, our progress on the education front, we are currently meeting with conservation curriculum creators in the region uh, and we will begin our formal education efforts um, reaching out to educators in fall 2018 for the 2018-2019 school year. So we're really excited about these efforts this year and um, what this year holds for education and outreach for the Pacific Wild Way. Um, you know, alongside the policy and the science, um, the public engagement piece is really important to us, especially the support and involvement of our supporters. Um, so we look forward to continuing to incorporate our supporters and a broader environmental community as we're launching the Pacific Wild Way in this first year. And um, please stay tuned for our hike series uh, we're hoping to lead some local outings this summer. Um, also, please keep in touch with our project updates on social media and the Wildlands blog and website. Um, and look out for more information on our June Patagonia event and our September launch event. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Jessica. We're, um, we're going to open it up for questions here. Hopefully we'll do this without pummeling too badly. I'm in charge of the technology, which is not a good uh, a good thing. But um, we, we have received some questions already uh, beforehand and, and some questions pending now. Before we get there, I wanted to make a couple quick points just in case we lose uh, some folks. One, uh, on the policy work, we are excited to have two summer interns starting with us. Uh, one starts this month. They are both going into their second year of uh, law school at uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Law Schools, and they are going to be diving into the state regulations in Washington and Oregon and, and elsewhere, but, but mostly up here, and helping us figure out how to incorporate connectivity a language into existing regulations as well as working with us on looking at things like the federal legislation and seeing how we can modify and adapt that uh, to apply at the state level. And then my second quick point, on the federal legislation, it's, it's easy to be really cynical that anything good could come out of D.C. these days, and I um, share that pretty uh, deeply, but uh, this bill actually is going to be, well, I mean, hearings going to be reintroduced this year uh, with bipartisan support. Uh, Congressman Graves from Louisiana one, has been working with us now for four months to uh, tweak the bill to uh, his uh, satisfaction, and he is one of the leading Republicans on the House Resource Committee. He wants to introduce the bill, um, and he wants to uh, get hearings on it. So. You combine that and Secretary Zinke's interest in keeping wildlife migration corridors open for big game animals, mostly elk and mule deers, uh, you know, playing to, the, to his hunting interest. But nevertheless, uh, we, we take our small victories where we can. So there's possibilities there. Uh, and now I'm going to turn to some of the uh, audience questions. One that's um, really kind of challenging for me is a question as to what's the wild way acquisition between the Olympic Peninsula and the main wild way that can create connectivity and gene flow. And if uh, I would try to go back to the slide, so I'd probably screw it up, but if you'll recall the map that showed the federal public lands and state public lands of Oregon, Washington, Northern California, um, it, there was noticeable the lack of uh, green flow onto the peninsula from the Cascade Range, with the exception of the Cascade Siskiyou region. And for now, probably our best hope is that 
um, we get more genetic flow of wide-ranging species through the Cascade Siskiyous. It's one of the only east-west um, areas for connectivity, and that then species could begin to move up the peninsula. Uh, but that this question really highlights uh, why we're doing this mapping and gap analysis because we need uh, we need people like Dr. Josh Lawler and his team to help us understand where the potential uh, connections are and once we know that from a land uh, a land type we can look at land ownership and start seeing well is it public DNR lands is it federal lands is it private forest private lands what tools do we need to use as an acquisition through um, easements or or is it regulatory so we can start to connect those uh, those uh, two areas. So let me, I'm now gonna go to, uh, I'm just gonna take them sequentially here. We have a number of questions. Uh, the first is, are a large number of land trusts in the Pacific Corridor? Most know their local and regional issues well and are connected to private landowners. Any plans for how to involve land trusts in this campaign? Short answer, yes, and I'm gonna to turn to Rebecca. I mean, uh, to Jessica here to address that. Uh, yeah, so there are quite a number of um, land trusts in the Pacific, um, especially here, in, uh, that are very active here in the Pacific Northwest, in Washington, in Oregon, and in California. And we have actually had several productive conversations with them um, already. So, for example, TNC, uh, Trust for Public Lands, um, the Eco Trust is another one that we are working with to form actually a collaborative that is centered around um, uh, trust uh, organizations. One of the benefits of having a cooperation with these organizations is that they do and have built successful relationships with private landowners and with these um, private forest management companies. And so um, working with them is very helpful for our overall connectivity plans going um, down into California. So yes, <laughs> and if you have any more contacts, please feel free to email me. So the next question is related um, in a way, what is your plan to engage private landowners, which is a great question. And I wanna first draw on some experience that we've learned in the West. A number of years ago, uh, we brought on some board members who, a board member in particular, who owned a very, very large uh, ranch in Western Colorado. And through his effort and others, we started to tackle this question of how does an organization like Wildlands Network uh, begin to build bridges and, and gain trust with the ranching community and, and large private landowners. The, the outcome of that was we started a uh, large uh, Western landowners collaborative effort. We got a number of ranchers involved. And ultimately, we spun that out into its own organization uh, Western Landowner Alliance, which is now a thriving NGO of its own that's focused on um, meeting the needs of large private landowners in the Rocky Mountain and Southwest region and the Northern Rockies. And they focus a lot on how those um, landowners can improve their own habitat for connectivity and carnivores and, and biodiversity. But they've kept you know, connectivity and corridors firmly in their mind. One of the important lessons we learned in that is that it's often necessary to you know, put your ego aside and let someone else take over um, the reins on some of these efforts. And we're, we're very um, you know, sensitive to people's perceptions and who they want to work with. We right now have a grant proposal where we're seeking money um, to engage uh, and hire uh, a coordinator who can work in Eastern Oregon, probably be based in Bend, and really do a lot of outreach to the more rural communities um, and, and learn more of their concerns and begin to build some of those bridges um, with our, our rural partners. And then, as Jessica said, the larger landowners, the timber uh, companies here in the Northwest, uh, those are all organizations that clearly have to um, you know, be brought into this discussion. Uh, next question, geographically, where will the Pacific Wildway connect up with the spine of the continent Wildway? Um, ultimately, it will connect in the far north in uh, the Yukon and Alaska, but you can also, if you recall that very first map of the Cascadia region, you can see 
um, where we move over through Hell's Canyon and there's you know contiguous public lands um, through Oregon, uh, through the Hell's Canyon region and into Idaho and the Idaho Central Complex and then into the High Divide and ultimately over to the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So there's connection there. There's also connection around the BC um, Washington border through the Kettle Range and uh, up into uh, southern British Columbia and then of course just north of us here in Seattle the, the whole Cascade Range traveling north into uh, British Columbia. In that particular region there's a great collaborative already um, working on that the TransLink effort. It's been an effort that has been uh, chaired by um, uh, um, Jen Watkins at uh, Conservation Northwest, who is a very, very important partner for us. Uh, and she's done a fabulous job, as has her colleagues, in bringing together um, the federal and state agencies uh, and the NGO community. And they've really focused essentially from Mount Rainier and north across the border. And so um, we, we've when we first started this initiative, we met with Jen and said, how can we help? Where can we help? Because you seem to have things pretty well rolling in that area. And Jen's immediate response was almost, well, there's a big region out here. We need to understand what's happening elsewhere. And so um, that's where we focused. But with Hell's Canyon uh, Preservation uh, Council, another very strong core partner in ONDA, we have some of those uh, conservation NGO links through Oregon and into Idaho. And we do a lot of work with some of the NGOs in Montana and Idaho in our Western program. So in time, those linkages will hopefully occur. Um, I'm gonna let Jessica handle um, the next question. Well, one of the questions that we received um, via email was plans to reconnect stream sheds and to reduce those lethal habitat fragmentation. And I wanted to address this question because it was something that's um, been very interesting to look at and how, how do you create connectivity in the Pacific without looking at streams and watersheds and, and eventually the marine environment. But I wanted to point out something that, um, a study that was done at Washington State University that came out of Washington State University in 2015 or 2015, and it was about uh, creating a national riparian conservation area, and that would be a nationwide system that pr would protect creeks, streams, and rivers. And one of the ideas that came out of that was most species, not all, but most species will follow water um, when they migrate. And so the idea behind that was if we start creating larger corridors around these streams or protecting watersheds in these forest habitats, we would actually be creating connectivity um, throughout the Pacific region. And so this is an idea that I am looking at this summer and how do we incorporate that into our science-based blueprint to really look, about, look at um, connectivity on the stream watershed level and making sure that we are going to be incorporating those needs of wildlife. But one of the points that I haven't touched on a lot yet is the marine environment and how do we start focusing on connectivity in the marine environment. It is incredibly important to the Pacific, as you know, with salmon being a um, primary uh, commodity, I guess, out here in the Pacific. But it is an incredibly important to think about our marine component, component to connectivity here in the Pacific. And we really haven't touched much on that, but hope to get more involved in that as we move along in our project. Now this, as you can imagine, is a very long-term project and um, will take extensive resources. So it's something that we are considering. Thanks, Jessica. Um, we have about 11 more minutes. There's two other questions so far that I'll uh, try to address. One is um, the question of road um, passageway like I-90 and Interstate 5 as it travels south through Southern Oregon and into California. Um, again, if you remember seeing that, that map showing the, the, the break in the linkage of our public lands just caused by uh, I-90, well, I-5 I north and south can have that same effect. So what's going on in Oregon and Southern California and elsewhere, and what are we doing to address this? And first of all, I would say Oregon has been 
behind Washington in terms of its mapping and modeling of corridors, but they have just started up an effort um, with the Oregon Department of Transportation, which has been quite active in the past year in seeking input and, and reaching out to the NGO community um, to engage in that. Uh, Jessica, um, you know, coming from California may have some insights there, so I'll, I'm going to pass on that right now, but I will say that you know, in addition to the areas we highlighted on the screen in Jessica's program, the other that we would love to develop up here because we see a real need is a road ecology focus uh, for the Pacific. We have a road ecology focus in southern, I um, mean, the southwest United States and in northern Mexico. We're actually doing great work with the Mexican Department of Transportation. And we have growing groups in North Carolina and Virginia focused on road ecology uh, back east. So we really hope to be able to leverage that existing expertise within the organization and start applying it in the Pacific Wild Way. I know, Jessica, do you have any other insights on I-5, maybe the court, the Cougar situation in right. L.A.? Right. So, yes. So um, I-5 is actually one of the largest barriers, if not the largest barrier to connectivity um, east, west, and north, south, actually. So um, as you know, it goes, I-5 goes all the way from um, the border down to the border. So it is um, interesting because it does cross all states. Um, but in California in particular, one of the biggest issues with I-5, and most of my experience at the moment has been with Southern California and I-5's um, crossing through or interruption of Cougar corridors um, there. Um, so the biggest hurdle that we see is with funding for these our overpasses. As I mentioned, the I-90 project was $551 million, and there was most of that funding came from the gas tax. But it's how do you make those projects viable up and down I-5? It's a, it's a very long expanse, and so that would mean potentially reoriented the, reorienting the roadway, creating overpasses uh, actually quite extensively and, and underpasses in Southern California alone. So that we're talking into the billions of dollars there for projects like these. So um, the biggest hurdle would be funding and also creating the momentum around changing our thoughts about um, what it means to interrupt connectivity for species like cougar, for species like grizzly, for species like wolves. And so without public support for projects like these, you there will be quite a bit of pushback on taking that tax money and putting it towards these bigger connectivity projects. So that's part of some um, one of the things we touched on was how do we get public support to um, create the momentum for this project, for creating funding for these projects that are going to take a lot of money. Um, but we can do that, and that's what we're hoping to do with our project, is engaging the public and engaging state legislators in changing the focus towards connectivity, for, towards biodiversity, um, and maintaining this sort of genetic gene flow. Um, on these routes. So I know that was sort of a roundabout way, but we are working on this issue and I um, I would like you to join us too and um, help us with that as well. Um, I think we have another question yeah. here. So the last question that we probably have time for and then we'll um, start to wrap up is, do you have a model approach to engage state legislators to get state agency support? And we are really actually working on that as we speak. There is a organization called the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, and they are having their um, annual meeting in Los Angeles at the end of July. And uh, we have been invited to help present um, one of the keynote um, panels for this organization, and it's going to be on state wildlife corridor legislation. In, in preparation for that, and just as part of our work, we are working with uh, some of our partners at the Center for uh, Large Landscape Conservation, uh, who have been long-term partners with us on the federal corridors bill uh, and the fashioning of that. And then we're working with um, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators and the Endangered Species Coalition 
uh, which will be instrumental in building uh, grassroots support for any legislation. So, you know, I think there's there's a number of different models you can you can modify the federal act for the designation uh, by state agencies and actors of corridors on state lands. You can take a look at what California did and and dig into existing regulations and laws and look at how you can modify and amend those laws to protect corridors. Um, the, the, the easy low level lift is the study, the study bill, you know, which at least gets the conversation moving. Uh, and then uh, an, an approach that was actually suggested by one of our supporters who is a uh, former partner of mine in, in private practice here in Seattle and truly one of the uh, most gifted environmental lawyers I've ever worked with, I had a very easy common sense approach, which was, well, why don't you just get all of the environmental consultants um, working on SEPA, the State Environmental Policy Act, to start incorporating analysis of wildlife connectivity in the cumulative effects analysis of the SEPA process. That way you'll get um, corridor and connectivity considerations considered in every project that requires SEPA. And uh, I think that's a, a, a very uh, insightful way to go, and it's one of the projects that we hope to have uh, our interns tackle and working with us in terms of being able to put a presentation for consultants and agency personnel on exactly what that would look like and what's the most latest and greatest science on connectivity and then to start meeting with some of the environmental consultants and others and, and state agencies and, and pushing that as um, just another way to get into um, you know, the, the state regulatory arena for corridors. And the nice part is you wouldn't have to fight the battle down in Olympia or down in Salem of getting a bill you know, through, the, through the sausage making of, of legislation. No. Um, I think that's all the questions we have today. We've got three more minutes. We've lost a few, but most of you have stuck with us for the entire time. We very, very much appreciate that. We know that your time is very valuable. Um, I would throw out, um, I'm getting a message here. There's a few other questions. Aha, I found a few other questions quickly. Are you going to look at the Pacific Wildway and connectivity for migratory birds? Yes, um, that is one of the layers that we hope to model um, with Josh Lawler. Uh, what do you need in the way of funding to implement a Pacific Wildway project and what are possible sources of those funds? Well, a perfect lead in to that question. Um, we are, we sort of view this project as we are in a startup phase. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition for dollars right now with uh, all the other social issues confronting us. And then climate change uh, mitigation sucks up a lot of the conservation funding. So where does the money come to protect biodiversity? Um, we've been meeting with a lot of foundations and doing that tried and true approach. And we're actually gaining some traction. But most of them are at the point of, well, come talk to me next year. You're making good progress. We want to see a little bit more progress. So this year, this really is very much um, my personal, Jessica's personal, if you build it, they'll come approach. And we really need some angel investors from our, our private individual supporters. And, and we're hoping that our presentation today is sufficiently compelling to make you consider um, joining us in that venture. We have set an initial uh, annual budget of about $250,000 a year uh, to really get this project uh, up and running. We have some interest from some of our uh, biggest donors in, in helping us actually launch a, a capital uh, campaign, perhaps later this year to help raise that money because we're really at a point where um, you know, we, we could use some money to help pay for Josh Lawler and to help pay Jessica and Rebecca's salary um, uh, and uh, and keep this moving. I think we just need to get to next year, and I think we'll get some of the large Pacific Northwest funders who historically support this type of work. I think we'll get them on board, and um, we're very confident in our ability to do so because we think we've identified a real need. When you talk to our partner organizations, they're enthusiastic. They're writing us letters of support. 
they see the value of having their work put into the larger context of you know the Pacific Northwest and the Cascadia region and the whole Pacific Wild Way. It helps them sell their products to their supporters, and most importantly, it's it is the ant it is the antidote that we need to protect biodiversity and to uh, for climate change adaptation and to stem the biodiversity crisis. And boy, um, you know if we can't do it up here in in Cascadia. Gosh, help us! Somebody help us! Pia, help us! Um, because we have probably have the best habitat, the best political climate, um, the the best educated public. We ought to be able to get this done here, and uh, we're confident we will. And and if you join up and, and join the team and support us, um, we're going to get this done. So, um, thank you all very much for participating. It's it's 12 o'clock. The, the machine does not magically turn off. If there's any other last minute questions, fire away. Otherwise, we really appreciate your time and your patience. We hope this has been instructive. We welcome feedback on how to improve our presentations. Um, these webinars are fairly new to us, so we're always learning and looking to do better. Thank you again, and uh, hopefully it's uh, sunny and beautiful where you are today, <laughs> and uh, you can get out there and enjoy a little bit of nature even though it's a Monday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, you will soon receive a follow-up email with a link to the webinar's recording. We invite you to share that with your friends, family, and colleagues, anyone who might want to engage in the Pacific Wildway Initiative. Have a great day.